Hello, Bethany Church. I'm Pastor Joe, and I want to welcome you to our online message and online service. We look forward to a live stream that's fully stable, and we learned just this week that we had an internet provider issue. So if you're watching this later, that's why we couldn't show it. We should be up and running by Father's Day this coming Sunday. Here at Bethany Church, we believe in a life-giving God that allows us to cross boundaries and bring his gospel and bring his truth into our world. And we are excited about what he's doing here at Bethany. We have some things in mind from our children's ministry to our youth to older adults. We have a summer mission project coming up later on in August. There's things happening here at Bethany, and we hope that you can be a part of the fellowship. But until then, this online platform allows you to know a little bit more about the Word of God and how He loves people. We've been going through a series on the book of Esther, and this week we're calling the the whole series, by the way, the whole series is called Reversals. But this particular week, we're using math as a background. God is the God over everything. He's over every situation. We're doing using the greater sign, greater sign, as in math, greater sign, to communicate how God is greater than he's over our circumstances. Would you pray with me as we look into God's word? Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to know and understand and be who you want us to be. God, you created us with purpose and with a vision, with an idea of what we might be in mind. I pray, Lord, that you help us seek that, seek your will, seek your face. We put this season and this time in your hands. I pray that you would allow your word, the word of God, to infiltrate, to permeate our hearts, to help us understand how you are the life-giving God. We thank you for this word in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I have a math story to begin with. I'm embarrassed to tell it, and at the same time, it means a lot. Now, maybe you know something about math, and maybe you're even good at math, or maybe math was something that is you, you so would like to just completely forget about it. Well, this math story might be for all of you. When I was a sophomore in high school, I was in trigonometry, and I don't even remember my teacher's name. I remember we had a test one day, and in trigonometry, you, you think about sines and cosines and tangents. You use triangles to understand our world better. There's a lot of cool things that trigonometry can teach, but honestly, if you were to ask me what an equation tells you or how to use trigonometry to solve anything, I would have to YouTube something to figure out what it all means. But I will never forget what happened one day in trig class. It's going to carry with me the rest of my life. And God is over what happens in trig. So in math, basically, if you get a concept, if you understand it, it's easy, it's simple. But if you don't understand it, it is impossible. Up until that time, math had come easy to me. I didn't need any help. Um, tutoring was not for me. I didn't need it. And then trig happened, and I was starting to struggle. So one day in, in class, rather than um, just fill the answer and maybe get it wrong, I looked over, looked over at Chad Johnson's paper. And I don't know if he had the right answer or not. The important thing, though, is that my teacher saw me cheating. And I will never forget how that felt. Now, as I recall, the teacher didn't downgrade me. She didn't throw out my test. She may have even let me retake it. I, I don't remember the academic side of it, but I can remember this, how I felt and what it was like to know that I had cheated and the feelings that came over me. Like, you know, I still, to this day, when I think about my hands can get sweaty and, and I'm just nervous and dry. as much as I've grown and changed in my life and I've forgotten most of the things I've learned about trig, I will never forget how I felt that day. God used ordinary circumstances in a trig class to teach me what I most needed to know about life. And I will never forget what happened that day. Today we're talking about how God is greater. He's over everything. He's greater than anything that we might 
face. In the book of Esther, we see how he uses ordinary circumstances to complete his process in his way within the life of his people. The overall series in Esther is on reversals, how God uses this, the time and place, the things that we're in, to get to a new place for his people and for individuals. And we learned last week how in the book of Esther, some people discredit, they don't believe it should belong because there's no mention of prayer, there's no miracles, and most significantly, God is not mentioned one time in the book of Esther. And yet it's included in the Bible. And <clears throat> I believe that it belongs in the scripture and it's more relevant today than ever because as we look around in our world, God is not always present. We can't see him. The world has rejected him. It ignores it because we cannot see, we do not believe. Today and this message is a reminder that while while God may not seem to be present, we may not see him. He is greater and he is over everything. To help us understand how God is over everything, I'd like to point out three areas where he's over. The first thing he's over is he's over history. God is over history. To fill you in on the story of Esther a little bit, last week we learned that King Xerxes, or emperor of the Persian Empire, had called a special assembly. He was going to uh, conquer another territory. We'll get into that in just a little bit. And in the process, he demanded his queen to come up in front of this royal banquet they had with lots and lots of alcohol, with hundreds of his leaders present, all drinking heavily. She was asked to come and be present. She refused and a surprise to no woman anywhere that she would refuse to walk and uh, parade in front of a bunch of drunk men. In the process, a little later on in the story, Esther is brought, and we'll talk about that. But what happens next, and the whole reason why we have Esther, is later on in chapter 3, we're told that a man named Haman, an Agagite, was going to kill Mordecai, Esther's cousin, and we sort of see him as an uncle, but he was really a cousin. He was going to kill Mordecai, but not just Mordecai, all of his people. In the book of Esther, we see how God is over history. And the reason I point that out is because, while we can't always remember, I know I can't always remember what I had for breakfast. I definitely don't remember everything I did last month. I don't know, you know, Beyond my, I, I mean, I know my parents, I know my grandparents, I know the names of my great-grandparents, and after that, it's all kind of foggy. God knows history far deeper than that. Haman and his history with the people of Israel goes way back to the story of Lot. If I were to take you into Haman's ancestors, I would have to go, thousands of years, 2,600 years, I'm sorry, 1,600 years before Esther's story, about 4,100 years from today. We're talking over 4,000 years ago is where this story is rooted. God integrates history from that far back. So here's where the story begins. Uh, Abraham and Lot were ancestors of the modern Jewish people. Actually, Abraham was. But he had a nephew named Lot, and they were together, and they split, and Lot eventually settled in a place called Sodom. Well, God was going to destroy Sodom, so Lot moved away with his daughters. They moved into the countryside, and the beginning of Haman's people was when Lot's daughters, not having anyone to be with as husband or be married and have a family with, and the security that they came, had relations with their dad, and the offspring from that led to the people that would become Haman's people. So kind of a bad start. From there, we skip forward a number of years, 500 years or more, when the Jews, the Israelite, the Hebrew people were in Egypt, they eventually escaped out of Egypt. And the, wouldn't you know what, the first people that they ran into when they got out of Egypt were the Amalekites or ancestors of Haman. And the Amalekites tried to stop Moses 
and his people from escaping um, their grasp. God's over history. So what did he do? He led the people of Israel to, to come in conflict with the Amalekites and they fought against them. And that story you might remember from your old Sunday school classes. That's the story where Moses, in order for the Israelites to have victory, Moses would have to keep his arms raised. Of course, after a while, his arms got tired, so he would droop his arms. And so Aaron and Hur would raise his arms up to help him stay under control. They had a great victory that day. There was more strife between the Jews and Haman's people later. Later, there's the story of a man named Balaam who had a talking donkey. Another story you might remember from Sunday school. And he was asked to call a curse. Balaam was asked to call a curse on the people of Israel. Couldn't do it. So God used that to speak out against the people that would hurt the Israelites. The last story in the history, again, hundreds of years before Esther, King Saul was given a chance to take on Agag, the king of Haman's ancestors. Saul refused to kill many of the people of Haman's ancestry, and they were set free. People of Haman's ancestry and the Jews have been fighting for centuries. And perhaps God knew all along this would be a problem. So he tried to stop that from being a problem, but it never happened. And so that leads us to Esther, where Haman was. God is over history. He understands the interplay between people. He understands how people don't get along because of their race, because of their background, because of whatever. They refuse to get along. He's over that history. He's over the world history. He's over your and my history. God is greater than our history. Also, there's a gap in Esther between Esther chapter 1 and Esther chapter 2. There's a gap there. There's a, a gap of about four years. And we're not told what that is, but by reading extra sources, Greek sources, uh, there's a Greek historian that recorded what was going on in the Persian Empire. Do you remember that banquet we talked about originally, that banquet that King Xerxes had? It was to draw support from all the people, all of his provinces. And he could promise by the wealth that he displayed that if they would go with him to war against the Greeks, they would have great wealth coming back to them. This point in time in world history is when that little gap, the gap between Esther 1 and get Esther chapter 2 happened. The king you know, showed off all this great glory and went off to war with the Greeks and lost. They went to Greece and they lost. So Esther chapter 2 happens, and you can read about that in Esther 2 verse 16. Then the seventh year of his reign, he came back, but... Vashti was already gone. They lost a war. He doesn't have a queen. So his cabinet, his ministers, his people he counts on to understand his opinion said, you know, King Xerxes, you're down. You just lost a war. You don't have a queen. You need to pick me up. Let's do a contest to find someone better than Vashti. So that's what they did. They, hold the, they held this elaborate, this elaborate fest, or pageant, if you will. And for over a year, these women from around the provinces were brought in to kind of speak, you know, to become beautiful and become, you know, all that was required. And Vashti was not invited. Esther was. Now I can imagine these, these officials, the cabinet members of, of King Xerxes, on purpose wanted to get rid of the outspoken Vashti and bring in a more meek and mild someone else. Maybe even from an obscure people group so they wouldn't have to worry about the problems that this outspoken strong woman would create. We know also from that same Greek historian that Vashti probably returned and she was a puppet master. She helped set the course when she was reinstated, set the course for her son to be on the throne. These advisors, understanding Vashti's hunger for power and desire, wanted to get her out of, out of the way. All that to say, God is over history. 
He uses the personality and the types, the, the way that people think, the advisors, the elaborate banquet, the pageant, all is he's God is using these as pieces and pawns to move and accomplish his great purpose. God is over the history of this world. At a time when Esther seems so long ago, thousands of years ago, we are reminded that God is over history and he's over world history. He's over my story and he's over yours. He's over all these things. We are invited in the book of Esther to remember that God, even if we do not see him, can use ordinary circumstances to accomplish great things. Not only does God know his people's story, not only does he know the world's story, he knows your story and he knows mine. That's the kind of God that we can trust in. That's the kind of God that we can believe in. But God's not just over history. He's over position. In Esther 119, we read about how God is maneuvering to get people in the right positions for his purposes. In Esther 119, it says, Therefore, if it pleases the king, the advisors said to him, Let the king issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also, let the king give a royal position to someone else who is better than she. When God made people, he knew it was in them. And he allows us for choice, but he uses our choices to accomplish his purpose. The interplay of Vashti in King Xerxes shows how people maneuver and God can use that maneuvering that we have and how smart we think we are to accomplish his purpose. When you watch the news, when you see what's going on in our world, do you sometimes think, I think people are trying to manipulate the situation and get their way? I don't know about you. I read, I hear, I watch what's going on in our world, and I think there's more going on than what I see. There's more going on than what I'm being told. And the good news is it's not just in the political world. Our Father in heaven is greater than that. He's above that and beyond that. No miracle of God is required for him to put these people in the position that he wants. God uses this cabinet, this queen, this emperor, all these people to be moving around, doing all the scheming they might do to accomplish his perfect plan. In the equation of life, in, in God's math equation, in his new math, he is over position. As we read Esther, it is notably absent of commentary. We are told what happens, but we are not always given the reason why. And there are some questions I would like to ask. Okay, so Mordecai, your daughter or your, your cousin, but you're looking after, she's about to become part of a king's harem. Is that really what you want? Is that best? How in the world is it that, you, God, you're using people that get drunk at banquets to accomplish your purpose. God, let's not, this doesn't seem to make sense. One of the things I learned through the studying of this, I, I, the people of Persia, the people of this time, believe that alcohol can put you in an alternative state. And I think we can see that today. Alcohol transforms your mind. Well, the ancients believed that that alternative state was directed by the gods. So you drink a bunch of alcohol and you're drunk, you become in this state of the gods. You could make a decision while under the influence of alcohol. And if it still made sense when you're not drunk anymore, then for sure it was a good choice. These are the kinds of people that make decisions like that, that he accomplishes his purpose. Can I just say, I don't always understand how this all fits. I can't put it all together, but God knows what and why these things are happening. The book of Esther doesn't always give us the why, but we are told what happened. In the book of Esther, we can see that God is accomplishing his will and his way through the positions that people are in. And clearly he uses the righteous and the unrighteous. He uses both to do what he would have done. 
Our God is overall. Esther, she eventually becomes queen. And I, and I would imagine when it first happened, it's like, why not? God is blessing his righteous ones. God's using his, he's just blessing his people. And it's all good. And maybe that's why we think that originally happened. But as you read through the book of Esther, you realize there's going to be some difficult days coming up for Esther. Because of her position, God can do great things, but it's going to put her in a difficult spot. As we think about the position we are in, as we consider what is going on and why, we will not always know what or why God is trying to work things his, his way or how it's supposed to work out or why. These questions are not always known. Esther reminds us that God is over these positions. He's greater than these positions. We can count on him to deliver us. The last point that I can see out of how God is over, his new math is over, is in his timing. At the end of Esther chapter 2, we're told about how Mordecai ends up saving the emperor, Emperor Xerxes. Esther 2, 22 and 23 reads, But Mordecai found out about the plot to kill King Xerxes, and Mordecai told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found out to be true, the two officials were impaled on poles. Now, just to an aside, clearly Xerxes is not a good man. He's a drunken king that prays his wife in front of people. He has a harem and he impales people on poles. This is not a good man. But in spite of all this, Mordecai becoming aware of this situation tells about a plot that will kill the emperor and saves his life. Now we could argue why in the world does a good person, Mordecai, try to save a very evil person, Xerxes. But again, God's over position. He accomplishes his will and his way to do his thing. But also what happens in this story, what also what happens is the timing of it. Mordecai is not... Granted, at the time of this, this stopping of the assassination plot, he's not granted any special acknowledgement or reward. And sometimes, can we be honest, that's the way life is. We do the right things for the right reason, and it doesn't yield any benefit. Something that could or should happen does not happen. But in the timing of things, we have to remember these things. And Esther teaches it, and it was true 2,600 years ago, and it's true today. God is over timing. He is over all. Now, certainly sometimes it does happen in a timely manner, and God's principles do apply of justice and truth and the right things. But many times, can we be honest, it doesn't happen in that way. Reminded in the book of Esther that he watched over King Xerxes, or Emperor Xerxes, as well as the people of Israel. He's working in God's righteous people. And certainly, certainly he is working in God's people. But is he working in the non-righteous people? Is he working on kings who impale people? Yes. Think about a situation you're aware of in this world. Something that seems to be wrong, off base, out of character, and just terrible. God can use that particular situation for his glory. He's the only one that can. In the common, everyday, ordinary events of life, God is working. No miracle is required. God is just working his way and designing what can happen for his good purpose. Along the way, when I think about his timing, I think about my place, about what's going on, I, I realize I fall short. I think about what it means to be a dad. I want to be a good dad. I want my boys to have fun, but I also want them to have a work ethic. I want my boys to uh, you know, treat other people well, but I want them to stand up for themselves. There's a balance I want. I want them to instill them with integrity and yet be strong. There's so many things I want. And some days I think I do a pretty good job at that. But there's many days I look back and I say, man, I could have done that better. 
Then I think about my role as a, as a husband. Some days I think I love Jen well and I, I, I do things right as I should. I care about her and I care about what she's got going on. I listen well. But I, can I be honest? There's a lot of times I come home, I'm not thinking about her and what she's going through. And I'm totally off base. Totally out of line with either how I say, what I say or how I say it. The condescension comes out. It's just not good. I think about my role as pastor. There's some days I think I got good ideas and God's working, the Holy Spirit's moving through me and Pastor Joe has got it figured out. And there's a lot of times, man, I, I'm not even close to where I need to be. I praise God that he is over me. He's over my situation. He loves my sons more than I do. He loves my wife more than I do, and he loves Bethany more than I ever could. What really comes out of this then to me is, what is my trust? Is my trust in how wise I am, how brilliant I am with the scriptures, how well I raise my sons or sons or you know love my wife? No, it, my trust is not in the things. Certainly I have to do things, but my trust is not in me. It's in what God is doing. My trust is not in what I might do, but what God might do through me. My understanding as I read through Esther, this was not necessarily about these amazingly righteous people that did the perfect things at the perfect time. It was always about what God might do in his time and in his will in his way. He is over it. The new math, God's math is over those situations. We can count on God to use everything for his purpose. But what we trust in makes all the difference. Something you might do right now. What are you questioning in your life? What is something you're looking at in your life right now where you're like, I don't know if I'm living up to this. I wonder what God is doing. How is this all supposed to work out? Those questions that we're asking may have been planted by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It may be planted by the Holy Spirit. It might be introduced into us for his glory. I would invite you to lean into those questions. Those times you don't know. Maybe it is God speaking into you to say, I know I can trust in you more. When I think about Esther's story, there's some things that I hope I live up to and you can too. First thing is what we might know. We do not see the whole picture. So why are we even trying? Why are we trying to pretend like we know how everything is supposed to work? A little humility goes a long way in these cases. We can ask God to speak in and to us by realizing he knows what's going on and we don't. It might be how we think. God is behind us. He, his history goes back to to Genesis, to 4,600 years ago, it goes into the future beyond what we can see. We can count on him. But then finally, what do we do? We can choose God and we can choose faith for the situations. Now, there's a twist I realize when I read this story and it, it stands out to me as I read this. We mentioned this last week and I mentioned it again today. God is not mentioned even one time in the book of Esther. Not once. God is silent. And that's a very common problem for those that seek the Lord. A very common occurrence is that he is not there. I didn't make a mistake in saying that. That's the truth. Can I take you to Mary and Martha? Their brother, Lazarus, was on his deathbed. They found Jesus and... They told him, you need to get here soon because they had faith and trust in God like maybe we do. We believe that God can save from health. They told him, and Jesus waited two days to come and visit them. On purpose, he waited. Can you imagine how lonely and silent and difficult those days in Bethany must have been? Two days is a long time long time to wait. Think about Moses. Moses tried to stand up for his people when he was about 40 years old. In the end, he murdered uh, some Egyptian slave drivers. 
which could have potentially started a process to release the people. And instead, <clears throat> Moses was accused of murder and he had to go on the run. For the next 40 years, we don't hear from Moses. He's out in the desert. Now, we can believe now, knowing the whole story, he was pre God was using that time to prepare him how to know that water is available in the desert, the ins and outs of the desert, and how to wander through and get through there, how to look after sheep in a difficult land. But for 40 years, do you think Moses knew that? Do you think God told him, oh, by the way, this is prep? He didn't know that. God was silent. Skipping ahead a few hundred years, the prophet Jeremiah lived relatively close to Esther's time, a little bit before time, maybe a maybe hundred years before Esther's time. He lived in Jerusalem. And at that time, the Babylonians were about to take the Jewish people into exile over into Babylon. Jeremiah was depressed. He was down. He was defeated by what was going on. He says, God, why are you letting this evil, bad people, Babylon, take over your, your promised ones, your children? And in the process, God gave him some words. And Jeremiah wrote those down, recorded them. But he never got to experience them, experience these promises for himself on this side of heaven. God's promises are real, but in the midst of it, sometimes there is silence. Instead of seeing God absent like he is in Esther, as God not being there, perhaps God's silence in our lives, the reason why we have this silence going on right now is he's drawing us that much closer to who he is. Now, can I be honest? I don't want that silence. I want God present. I want God there. I want to know. I want him to speak to me, to hear his voice. But sometimes God doesn't do that. He gives us a gift of silence. And I said that, what I meant, a gift. Because if God can trust us in silence, that's a form of intimacy. That's closer than maybe anything else we may have. He knows and he can trust in us. He's building into us that same kind of love and trust that only the those closest to him might have. God is over everything. And sometimes we see it, many times we don't. God is over that. There's a verse I'd like to close with. Jeremiah 29, 11, That same prophet that didn't get to see God work on this side of heaven wrote this down. He said, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the war, the, the Lord. Plans to prosper you, to give you hope, to give you a future. That's Jeremiah 29, 11. I think all of us have learned through this COVID-19 pandemic that our plans might change. Did your plans change for what was going to happen in the summer of 2020? I know mine did. There's going to be a trip to Texas. There was going to be a camp trip to Lake Ellen. There's going to be all kinds of things that we had in mind. That's what we had in mind, and it all changed. And going forward, can we really count on those things that we think are going to happen to happen? Maybe so. But I think we all learn our plans might change. But when God makes plans, they're fulfilled. God is over history. He uses all things to work out for his glory. God's over position. He can, he can maneuver the evil, most worst evil kings and presidents and diplomats or whomever you can think of. He can use the worst to bring about his plan. And his timing, which may not make sense to us, can be right on schedule. Last week I asked you to read the book of Esther. And many of you did. I heard a lot of reports. And I think... If there's anything, not just thing, I know anyone that is serious about growing maturity and in their faith with God, if, if, it's going to start with reading God's word on their own time. Not even coming to church, not even going to the Bible study. It's when they read God's word on their own time. If you are serious about growing in your faith, start reading God's word. Another thing that we can do and we must do if we're going to be serious about growing in God's word is to memorize the scripture. I urge you to remember Jeremiah 29, 11. 
For I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you hope in the future. Memorize that verse. If you've already memorized that verse, look at Jeremiah 29, verse 12 and 13. The verses that follow are powerful reminders of what God is doing in this time and this place. Bethany exists. The Holy Spirit came. The Bible is written. Jesus Christ came on earth to do what? To establish a relationship between us and God. That's not an obscure, unknown thing. That's something we can have. In the midst of difficulties and challenges, we can know that kind of God. He is over all. He's above all. And he wants to know us personally. This week, know that he is over all. Know that he is your great God. Believe and understand and know that even in the silence, he is there. Trust in him. Choose God and choose faith. And one little thing to do, start memorizing that, that verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. His plans, hope, future, we need that. Seek that. Know that. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you speak and you remind us, you teach us, you show us who you are and what you're about. Help us to seek and know you more. I pray that you'll help us discover how you are over history, over position, over timing, and you're drawing all people to yourself. And even silence is how you might be working to accomplish your purpose in your people. I put this time, this day, and this age in your hands. I pray that we would be some of the ones that point the way to, to you and drawing closer to you all the time. In Jesus' name, amen. Next steps, if you are open to taking the next steps in your faith walk and journey with God, I urge you to check out bethanyscofield.org. We have next steps, we have resources. My email's on there. I'd be happy to talk with you about what next steps might be for you. We'll be back on next week, 8.30 and 10, and the live stream should be up and running. We hope that we can join with you in celebrating what God is doing. There are exciting things happening at Bethany. We're looking at new children's ministry opportunities, a summer missions project, which is August 3rd through the 7th, if you want to write those dates down. But ultimately, what we are looking forward to most is how God is moving in his people through history, through position, through timing, to accomplish his purpose. I hope that you will join with us in that journey. God bless.